Radio, mate. Hit me with your best shot. All right, mate. <coughs> well, I scripted a few things. Um, usually with our podcast, we try and just go completely off off soul. But with you, my friend, <laughs> I was like, I need to. Uh, I really need to write some stuff down because your knowledge base is fucking incredible. So, oh, well, <laughs> probably better that way than the other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just wanted to start by saying thank you. Uh, for your body of work with the Czech Institute mm. and uh, for, for me and my my business partner Callan Kraus, um, you know this is a this is a dream come true to actually sit down and and talk to you like this. So cool. And uh, it sucks he can't be here, but he was like, man, you got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to do it. So thanks. You so can much throw for that, some Callan. commentary in from him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I will. I will. And uh, yeah, man, it's a trip. So three weeks ago. Um, I was speaking at my dad's funeral before I started here. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, now I'm sitting here with Paul Check, and I just know that he would be really proud, man. Well, that's you good, know? yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a hard transition. Yeah, yeah. I, I know it But I, well. I wanted to get, yeah, I wanted to get that one out of the way. Uh, yeah, because it was just a, it was a big, it was a big thing, and, and life's funny how it just, it just, now I'm here, you know, like mm-hmm. it's, it's. Yin and yang, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One thing becomes another. Yeah, yeah. That's so part of the lesson there is that um no matter how hard things seem something else is always coming. Mm. Everything's giving every everything that seems to be dying is giving birth to something else. I'll give you a good example. The day we moved into this our home here, I said to my soul, if you would have let me know this is what I was working towards, it sure would have taken a lot of the stress out of the journey. And my soul said, yeah, but it wouldn't have been near as much of a surprise when you got here. (laughs) And um, Mm. having done too many shamanic journeys to count, you you know, you, you go through periods where they can be very, very tough. But then when you come out the other side and see all the awakening and realizations and awareness of where healing is needed and, you know, inspirations, motivations, clarifications, you realize that sometimes you got to clear things out of the way, but you got to also let parts of you die that need to die and, and you see how in, na- in nature life feeds off a of death. And that there's Mm -hmm. the Ouroboros, you know, the snake that eats its tail. And it's, it's just the, it's a paradoxical way of life. The the point being is if you get too caught up in any one thing, it can suffocate you. But if you realize that what we're letting go of is making room for or birthing something else Mm -hmm. for example when you lose your father you have to step into your authentic independence because your for sure your physical father is no longer there but it can deepen your spiritual connection to your father and realize that you know the soul of an individual never dies neither does their consciousness so having worked with a lot of people on the other side over the years you come to realize that we're in a very powerful living mythological experience where the the material world is quite an illusory, necessary but illusory experience and that if we get too attached to the physical, be it the body of a person or a pet or, um, you know, anything that we try to hold on to, it sets us up for um, the pain of trying to stop the flow of of reality, of time, of mm. nature, of life. Yeah, it's it's a it's a tr- it's a tricky Mexican finger trap. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, you know, me and Dad used to talk all the time on death. He loved you. He loved your work. Was oh, that right? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Dad. And yeah, he uh, man, he was. 
the day the day passed, we he, I was talking to him and, and um I had my heart was pumping. Mm-hmm. I was like, what's going on? He died of a um, aortic aneurysm, mm. but the vaccine. He he was oh. complaining of part pain after the vaccine. That's terrible. Sorry to hear that. Yeah, yeah, it's a bummer. But like you said, he dro- he dropped his body, and he was a spiritual man. And he, the day it, he goes, Jakey, if it's my time to go, uh, I'm I'm gonna go. You know, he goes, I'm I'm ready. Like, and it's crazy to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. And then he, and then I wake up in the morning, and man, it, like you said, it's it's like a that you know, ne- I never knew how alone you could feel in the world until that happened. However. Um, I felt this this urge of stepping up into being a man. Mm-hmm. Yes, that's definitely real. Yeah, and it was a that and becoming a father; those two will <laughs> upgrade your software. Absolutely. When you uh, yesterday, when uh, when I finished IMS four for for the listeners out there, I finished level four uh, IMS four with uh, Matt Walden yesterday, which is a fucking amazing amazing course and a lot of knowledge. And it's going to take me years and years to you know, work on it and, and, and get better at it. But when we're finished, you said the Czech Institute's been such a such a massive thing for me. Like I've 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 put my life and my life, heart and soul into this and, you know, it's it's nearly broken me a few times, but mm. I'm I'm fucking still here and I mm. and I love it. And you said when I when I die he goes, you fucking, you go, I f- you fucking cheer for me, man. I'm going to be up there, like, having the best time in the world. And I got the feeling as though, like, death to you is because you do all the shamanic journeys and the, mm-hmm. and the, like, you've seen, it feels like you've seen behind the curtain. Oh, yeah. I've been back there many times. In fact, I've been back there and not known how I was going to get back to this <laughs> world. And it was deeply disturbing because... I knew that I still had work to do and, you know, kids and Penny and, you know, I just knew that, um, that if I was not to come back, it would be a a real stress for people that weren't ready to handle it yet, you know, and it's, it's, uh, you know, we have a very deep sense of soul contract soul responsibilities within ourselves so uh, you know the the experience of dying is extremely blissful but it's as though you're in a balloon riding up into higher higher dimensions but to the degree that you haven't fulfilled your soul contracts it's like the balloon has a, a tether on it so you get going and then all of a sudden it stops and you can feel who's holding the tether. Mm. You know, it's my son Paul Jr. <laughs> it's Angie. It's Penny. It's Mana. It's Zoe. Um, mostly them, but I've been honestly so deep and so far gone that I was losing any sense of self. Like I was actually just merging into the Tao. And the, it is really like, you know, Rumi says you're not a drop of the ocean, you are the ocean in a drop. But when you're coming back into the ocean, there's a very powerful sense of everything that I ever was, every memory that I ever had, it's all gone. And so you face this choice of, do I maintain the memory experience knowledge and connection to all that or do i just let go into the emptiness of god and you realize that you can't know love without individuality without a self and so because love is ultimately the foundation of all relationship which is why God dreams all this into existence so that it has an experience of love because with you know God is ultimately utterly all alone so Mm -hmm. God has no other by definition God is that for which there is no other so because there is no other God has to dream itself look into itself and the act of dreaming and looking in creates the perceptible other just like when you dream or anyone dreams all of a sudden there's all these characters in the dream but they're all coming from you Mm. but they seem 
very other until you reach the point where you can do lucid dream work and actually realize you can manipulate the dream. You can change the characters. You can do whatever you want to do. But when you come to that point of union with God where you realize that you're about to join the... It's not even oneness. It's it's uh, That's why I use zero as a symbol for God because there is nothing there. There is just nothing there. And it's an abyss of absolute emptiness it's really hard for the mind to work with you know Mm. a a good analogy would be if you jumped off a cliff that went forever and there was just no bottom you'd just be falling and falling for millions and millions and millions and millions of years and (laughs) never stop falling that's really scary to the ego (laughs) it's it's very scary to the ego it's 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 worse than scary it's yeah it's it's a it's a it's like a, a uh it's like a nuclear bomb going off inside of your self-consciousness so um it, it's not an easy transition and so but you see that is that is the drive of life itself ultimately god's only way of being is life so to separate from the flow of and the hunger of life for life itself is ultimately the only way God can experience itself. So there, beyond life, there is nothing. And so it's, you, you feel how, just like the river wants to flow downhill, it always wants to come down the mountain and make it to the ocean. Um, it's very, very hard to get water to levitate on its own because its sense of of existence is the flow back to the ocean metaphorically it's always mm. moving back to the ocean it's always going toward the center of the earth toward the center of everything and life is always wanting to give birth to itself it's just this ever rolling ever creating flow of existence mm. uh, which is 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 the embodiment of love and so um you know what's behind it is unconditional love but the paradox of it sounds really good but yeah. when there's no conditions that means there's no i no thou no self no other no place no person no thing so it's uh it's a state mm. that isn't really reconcilable you can't it's zero times zero always equals zero and that's the paradox of all of this. God is a zero, and zero times anything equals zero. But when you multiply zero times or divide zero by anything, it's a process. So the act of saying, okay, zero times zero equals zero, you just went through a process. So paradoxically, here you are writing it on a piece of paper, and the answer is the same every time, but you had to go through the process. And so that's God. That's God going through the process, <laughs> right? Yeah. Multiplying itself, mm. infinity by anything is infinity. And so you, 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 you know, the thing, Joseph Campbell says something pretty profound. He says, don't rush for nirvana because nirvana means to blow out or to extinguish. And he says, you, you, you don't know what you're going to pop out as next. You could end up being a cockroach <laughs> Or a rock on a star system in some unknown galaxy or universe, and the whole thing just starts all over again. So you go through billions and billions of years of evolution, then you go, oh, here I am, and you do it again. Yeah. And because there is no time in God, uh, this it's a, it's like the, there's no way for the mind to wrestle with that thing. But when you go as deep as I've been into these ceremonies, and I've been into total non-dual states on Tai Chi. I've been in many union states, meditation without medicine, so I have been able to get there both ways. The, the, the paradox is always the same, though, and that's really why you can't, you can't really say anything about God, which is one of the things I keep telling people, stop believing in these religious books mm. that tell you what God is and what God wants, because there's no way to know what God wants. 
<laughs> there's no way to go know what God is unless you become God. And when you mm. become God, there's nobody there to report it. <laughs> so yeah. really, all of these books are just a collections of other people's stories. And if mm. you believe them, then you depart from your own story. And that's the danger. Yeah, the... Mm. Yeah, I feel you on that, and that's that's it's such a paradox. That's why on the back of my shirt it says, "What a, what a paradox! Give it up to have it all." Mm. And and Ramdas said, "What did Ramdas say?" He said, "Lots of things." Yeah, lots of amazing things. He said, "Uh, oh God, I'm sorry, lost my train of thought." Anyway, be here, <laughs> be here now. Yeah, he said that. Here we are. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> here we all are. Yeah, <coughs> man, he's he's amazing, and I know you've you've looked into his and Alan Watts's and everyone else's work, but. Uh-huh. Uh, one one thing I've been dying to ask you, man, for a long time is when I was 26, I had this horrific leg break on the mm-hmm. trampoline, and it's going a certain way in life that wasn't great. Spirit was wanted me to go the other other way, and mm-hmm. I was going the other way, and I was pushing everything against it. Being a professional athlete, and I thought everyone was telling me how good I was, and you get to travel the world, blah blah blah. But my heart was guiding me in a completely different direction, and I wasn't listening. And uh, I was doing a lot of work with Jan Carton at the time, and what I thought was a body thing ended up being a mental emotional thing for me so it broke my leg instantly I had a feeling of like shit I know what this is about that's the first words that came out of my mouth I know what this is about I was like I need to go in this direction which was helping people and Mm -hmm. and and fuck man it's filled my heart so much to 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 get you know work with clients and help them with their life has truly given me the feeling of like fulfillment in in myself whereas when i was an athlete it was such a it felt selfish it has yeah. to be yeah you know when you're an athlete you you have to focus on yourself or you'll never achieve very high levels of yeah. performance and that's the you know that's the uh that's one of the paradoxes of mastery and it uh forces you into a very high level of individuation where you you, you kind of have to be like a hermit mm. and really focus but the problem is you can become um you can get what jung calls an archetypal possession where you're so completely focused on achieving one thing that relationships with lovers, girlfriends, boyfriends, spouses, family mm. they get pushed to the side And unfortunately, a lot of athletes end up with very broken relationships so that by the time they achieve their objective, (laughs) they've achieved one thing, but they've got a trail of tears behind them, you know, (laughs) like it's like a wake of destruction. It's very, very hard to manage high levels of success. This is why Ojo said, if you want to be a star, you better learn to play with fire because the pressure of it on many levels is extremely intense. And that's why you see so many great athletes, musicians, movie stars, um, singers, uh, artists. They end up usually uh, having very problematic lives, oftentimes with uh, drugs and, you know, suicide and, Mm-hmm. All, all sorts of stuff mm-hmm. like that. It's just uh, the the isolation, the um, expectation of other people, um, the pressure that we put on ourselves. The um, you know one of the most painful things is that people always love you when you're doing well, but all of a mm-hmm. sudden you're a nobody the day you're not doing well. And I've seen that. And who you are, yeah. <laughs> crack a lot of professional athletes yeah. just break their hearts and mm-hmm. you see it in many many cases so um it's it's a very hard path to manage and it requires very skilled coaching and unfortunately there's not very many skilled coaches out there because a lot of the times the coaches are riding the athletes in other words they're, yeah, they're feeding off their money. They're, and Yeah, they're, they're feeding off them. And, and so they're really much more invested in the athlete achieving certain levels of professional success or monetary success because that's what the coach is after. Mm. And so a lot of coaches get so caught up in that that they can't, they become unconscious as to when the athlete or whoever they're <clears throat> working with is 
actually in a mental emotional crisis and so the the athlete or the individual often um, breaks before uh, Humpty Dumpty can be put back together again <laughs> yeah for sure and that's a it's a tough process and I feel like that's kind of what I went through to some degree, but it was, like you said, it, that dies and blossoms out something way more fun. Mm -hmm. However, the, when I was laying there uh, with my leg broken, I, they gave me morphine mm -hmm. and they, then they took me to the uh, hospital and they said, we're going to have to put your bone back in your skin. Mm -hmm. um, you gonna, we're going to put ketamine in you. So they mm -hmm. like pretty much overdosed me on ketamine. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went to a spirit realm of sorts. I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was my imagination making it up or... But I went to a place of shapes and I had this feeling of though something w had created this place and it felt very warm and loving. But then, sounds weird to say it, but you're, you're, they had you come in uh, head, head and shoulders and Rum Dust come in head and shoulders. I don't know if that's because you guys have helped me probably the most in my life, mm. just in, in the presence. Mm. And I felt so at ease, like I've always been scared of psychedelics and and things like that and i felt so at ease in this place of um i i don't know what to put into words you know it's it's a interesting it was an interesting experience for me and it was a, a life-changing experience mm -hmm. and they said welcome you've just begun your spiritual journey mm -hmm. good <laughs> yeah well there's many many dimensions beyond the physical dimension the infinite dimensions but you're describing really what's often referred to as the hyper dimension where uh, it's also called by Chris Hardy the SIG dimension which is the dimension of meaning it's where consciousness um, carries its meaning uh, it, it's it's below the realm of phenomenon so if you think of the zero point field it's buzzing with um, activity um, it's often referred to as the quantum foam, which is what creates the whole universe. But when souls die, they go out of the physical dimension into a hyper dimension where paradoxically you're on space and time, so you confront a lot of mysteries that the rational mind cannot deal with. Um, but really it's... Um, it's really where the consciousness that you are goes to meet the rest of itself. And that's where you mm. meet whoever is you, important to guide you to... That's why you, it's very, very common in near-death experiences that people meet relatives. Mm. And um, almost always it's relatives that we know and have a sense of connection to that help us cross over but it's really kind of like the mind of god that you mm. go into and it's um it's where we all go and we just dream up another <laughs> existence yeah <laughs> is so is that is that what happens you know when you when you pass away you go to that place first and then depends on the individual really we die into our mind so, for example, someone that's raised in a kind of a hardcore Catholic Christian upbringing can become so afraid of God because, you know, God will burn you in hell and you got all the sins and, <laughs> you know, so you got all this baggage, right? So when people like that die, they're actually so afraid of God, they won't move toward the light to merge into that dimension. Mm. And so they'll stay in a, in a, in the astral realm, kind of like in a, a ghost existence for any number of you know years could be hundreds of years and they just won't go because they're afraid of god and and so having studied countless nde cases you know there's a lot of commonalities but there's also very very big differences in them and so some people for example have very hellish experiences when they die but the person sitting right next to them had an absolutely beautiful experience and mm. some some describe experiences that are kind of consistent with the Egyptian Book of the Dead, some mm -hmm. with Tibetan Book of the Dead, some with kind of Christian concepts. Um, but really, 
you, you die into your mind. And that's one of the reasons I keep te- teaching people about the mind and saying, you know, mm. you need to be careful how you use that thing because mm. you can create quite a trap for yourself. <laughs> But ultimately, you see, God d- digs all of this stuff because God's totally interested in experiencing everything, mm. good or bad, and um, because God can't die, so there's no fear of death for God. It's really just a grand show that makes it all kind of fun and interesting. So the, if you want to, you know, believe that God's going to burn you in hell and and kind of the kind of standard Abrahamic religious conception. Then you get to ride that experience, and God says yes to everything. I mean, unconditional love never says no. So what, whatever whatever it is is just fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, yeah, every, everything, good and bad. <laughs> everything has to go back to God, and it's all zero at the end of the day. So mm. good, even good and evil no longer exist. Um, <laughs> so yeah, the point being is there's a lot of different... Um, experiences people have but ultimately the dimension in which the souls go into is not a physical dimension it's it's a it's a it's a it's really um an eternal now type experience where it's very hard to reconcile because you can have conversations you can have Mm. people like me or anyone else come to you but one of the key things to remember is that a standard hallmark of dream analysis is that no matter who's in the dream, they're all expressions of you. So we quite Mm. easily forget, right? In other Mm. words, it looks like you're sitting there and I'm sitting here, but the same thing that's looking through your eyes at me is looking through my eyes at you. And that's the (laughs) great, great trick that God plays because without that, there can't be love. There can't be relationship. There can't be experience. Mm. But as you die, you you can move further and further back towards the actual consciousness that's in everything, as everything. And then you ultimately realize that it's just all one. It's all the same being. It's all the same consciousness. So Mm. uh, in a nutshell, what I'm saying is souls can have as many different experiences as there are souls in existence, which is a lot. (laughs) Oh, man, it's 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 out there. And it's like you said, it's it's like unconceivable by the by the mind by the ego well the mind by definition is a cutting tool um you you know you can't actually have a thought that means anything if it doesn't exclude other possibilities this is why the ancient alchemists referred to the mind as the logos cutter um you know if i say Mm. if there's 20 cats over there of all different colors and i say jake look look over there and tell me what you think of the cat, but you see 20 of them, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if I say, look at the black cat, your eyes will go right to the black cat, and you won't look at the other ones because you know I'm talking about the black one, so you're going to see this black cat doing something over there, and that's how the mind works. If mm. it doesn't exclude, you can't make heads or tails of anything. Uh, you know, this is... Um, There's a saying, why did God create time? So everything didn't happen at once. So time actually creates the illusion of separation. Mm. And the mind creates the illusion of separation. Um, You can't have a relationship with yourself if there is no other because you wouldn't know the difference between everything else and yourself. (laughs) It would just be like, uh, you know, like when a baby's born... pees and poops all over everything because it thinks the couch is it. Mm. It thinks the floor is it. Uh, It thinks mommy is Mm. it. It doesn't know the difference. So there's this sort of uh, awakening of, oh, that dog that just growled at me because I pulled on its whiskers Mm. somehow isn't me, you know. So the progressive coming into self-consciousness comes, this is why I call that stage sex and violence love because... Mm. We're all born of, through an act of sex, but we also have to go through the challenges of learning how to deal with the uh, forces of the environment, be it gravity, be it um, sharp objects, uh, things that bite, um, what is hot, what is cold, you know, because of the, or, the, in order for the life form to live, it has to conform to the environment that it needs to be in to survive. Mm. So there's a period where 
the child's in the state of oneness, but it progressively gets shocked into this idea of, of itself as a mm. separate individual. And then it, once it starts to, re, you know when it starts realizing that because it starts to use the word I, which takes usually about two years before a child. The two words that distinguish that the child's ego is now developing is I and no. So if a child says I or no, it knows somehow that it's not you or the table. Mm. And so that's when it's journey into um, separation from the whole progressively develops. And then, mm. of course, is the crisis of um, feeling so isolated. Mm. And a midlife crisis is really when you come to the point that you realize your ego is, is actually much, much more of a trickster and a problem maker <laughs> than it is a problem yeah. solver. And so that's usually when the spiritual life begins, when you actually reach the point where you realize, okay, whatever it is that's making decisions for me is not a very good accountant and it's not a very good whatever, bus driver, lover, you know, because it gets in trouble all the time. It just, mm. uh, because the ego is really made of everything from the past. So it, it can't ever really truly be present with what's needed in the moment. Um, only by going to the soul which is also inclusive of the spirit, can you live in the present and, and really be with somebody mm. as opposed to projecting, oh, this or that, or, you know, yeah. I don't like this, I don't like that, you know. That that's that all kind of keeps you stuck in belief systems that are um, a priori, previous to, prior to. Yeah. Whereas... Uh, it takes spiritual practice and training to be able to have one foot in both worlds. And you see this in tarot, wherever you see, for example, tarot 14 or tarot 17, um, where you have usually an angel or a woman with one foot in water and one foot on land, or uh, pouring water from one jug to another, which mm -hmm. water means the unconscious, mm -hmm. land means the conscious. So what those cards are telling you is that there's a relationship between the unconscious and the conscious. Tarot 8 in the Rider weight deck is strength. And that's the woman taming the lion. The lion represents the ego and she represents the soul. So there's always this um, mm. interrelationship between the conscious and the unconscious. Uh, between timeless and time, um, between the <laughs> afterworld and this world, mm. they're really not separate. It's mm. um, tasting of ta tasting of earth, but also tasting of spirit. Well, earth is spirit. It's just spirit moving slowly enough for you to interact <laughs> with it. Uh, it's it's the condensation of consciousness. So, mm. earth is like a holographic crystallization of a big dream. Mm. Really, the whole universe is 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 the condensation of God dreaming. Uh, you know, if you think of like what a hologram is, it's so real, people can't often tell the difference between a holographic image and an actual presence of. For example, when oh, it was a while back now. I don't remember how long. Maybe 2010. They, after Michael Jackson died, they decided to do a concert because they had filmed him. Oh, yeah. I saw that. Yeah, and so <laughs> it w they had to stop doing it because it really upset people mm. because it was so real. Um, a lot of people, particularly Christians, felt it was dishonoring Michael Jackson because it created the illusion that he was still alive. Mm. And so it was very upsetting to a lot of people because they couldn't to tell if that was really <laughs> him or not. You yeah, know? And yeah. so it was like, wait a minute, is he alive or dead? Mm. And so... My point is that a hologram can be so real, it can trick the mind, but all you got to remember is God's got infinite power, infinite energy, infinite processing speed, infinite intelligence, um, and so therefore God dreams things into existence and has the energy to mm. crystallize them in form so real that you can't tell the difference right <laughs> and and that's 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 what it, a virtual reality is that we're really in a virtual reality it, simulation it feels like that sometimes so yeah. a few weeks i was laying on the massage table at uh, corrective culture before i come over here and i said you know what fuck it i'm just gonna 
I'm going to manifest a, a rock stacking session or a, or a podcast for Paul. Mm. <laughs> See what you can do. <laughs> oh, it was crazy. When did you, like a lot of people, I've, I've been following you a pretty long time. When did you start? You, you seem to have softened over the years, you know. <laughs> 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 when you were, uh, you know, in the airborne and, and all of that and you were racing and you were doing all that, you were very, you know, early lecture days, which I've listened to a fair bit, you were, you had this just demeanor that was just like, don't fuck with me. Well, because I was tired of people being a pain in the ass. Mm. You know, whenever you pioneer anything, you get, you know, there's an yeah. old saying, you can tell who the pioneers are. They got arrows in their backs. Yeah. Einstein said, new ideas are first violently rejected, then they are accepted with scorn, and finally they are used as if they always existed, but they forget who brought them to the, there, mm. right? A good example is I brought the Swiss ball to the exercise industry in 1988, but I go to gyms and have trainers walking up to me, chewing me out because they say I'm doing dangerous things on the Swiss ball. They haven't got a clue who I am. And when I first brought the Swiss ball to the industry, I got attacked left, right, and center everywhere mm. I go. I got called a fag. I got, you know, <laughs> everything. It was just like, get that stupid ball out of here. And, mm. you know, just rejection, rejection, rejection. Then they started using it with scorn. Mm. Then now they use it like it was always there and they don't even know yeah. how it got there or who brought the information and blah, blah, blah. So... You're you're talking about the time in my life where uh, you, you, the problem is is that the, the, two, the two kinds of people that attack you are the ones that are so egotistical they can't see the obviousness of a good idea, mm. and so they try to defend their lesser ideas. And two people that are just too stupid to realize that they're standing in front of somebody a lot more intelligent, a lot more skilled, and a lot more experienced than them, but they'll still go at you. It's, it's you know it's like. It would be like some guy who thinks he's a tough guy because he's a street fighter picking a fight with, uh, you know, a, a very skilled black belt yeah. and not realizing yeah, that this fuck. guy's going to dismantle him in five seconds, but he stands there being mouthy, Yeah, you know, and I just, I got to the point in my life, I mean, I started lecturing in 1988, so by the time you're watching lectures of me, I'm already well seasoned. <laughs> one, one year before I was born. <laughs> right, you know, so... um. I got to the point where I was just tired of the flies buzzing my head all mm. the time. And it's like, okay. And I used to say to people that would go at me, if you're going to pull a sword on a samurai, you better know how to use it. Because mm. I had a certain amount of patience. But when people, you know, were obviously trying to show off for people or mm. or be just dickheads, you know, I... I usually it would only take me a couple of minutes. And, and my favorite way to do it was I would just ask them questions that if they answered, it would be obvious that they were either wrong yeah. or they didn't know what they're talking about. Mm. And uh, so, yeah, I did have an edge on me just because I, I got exhausted of, look, I could prove everything I was teaching. Here you mm. are, just did IMS4, right? You Holy learned fuck. about the Czech totem pole. Yeah. You know how many freaking doctors would argue with me about fuck. that? While I was rehabilitating their patients in record time mm. when nobody else could figure them out mm. and they wouldn't even pay attention to that. They just sit there and go at me about why what I was doing is wrong. Why mm. are you working on someone's neck or jaw when I sent them to you with back pain? So I'd stand there and explain it all to them. And even though it was obvious anatomy and I could show them in anatomy books and show them in physiology books, but they still would just ignore that. Mm. And so I, I just got to the point where, okay, you're more invested in your goddamn programming and your own mm. blindness than you are in actually recognizing that someone's standing in front of you right now that can teach you something. Mm. And when you go through that for years and years and years, it just gets exhausting. Yeah, I can imagine. When, when, was the, when was the moment where you softened or you, you know, connected with your soul and, and, and softened up? You know, was it the mid-30s? Was it earlier? Was it before that or... Well, I think I was always connected with my soul. That's mm. what drove me to do all this. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think uh, what really happened that that d delivered the blow to my ego was I was, uh, I won't tell you the whole story, it's just a long story, but mm. you probably heard me tell it anyhow. Um, one day I was doing a lifting stunt where I was putting, uh, I used to put people over my yeah. head and do lunges with even huge guys. I did a six foot eight, 250 pound strong man. He was in my class 
as a backstory, he was in my class. He was always bragging about how strong he was, but I could look at his body and know he wasn't that strong. I mm. mean, if I if I could grow my body to six foot eight, two fifty, I'd have killed him. Mm. And so I kept finally one day I just said to him, Quit bragging about how strong you are, because you're not that strong. He looks at me and goes, What do you mean? I'm a Highland game strongman competitor. I do this, this, this. I said, Okay, if you're so strong, here I am. I weigh 190 pounds at that time. I was in good shape then. Mm. I said, Pick me up and put me over your head. He couldn't for the life of him. Mm. I said, okay, now stand up. <laughs> I picked him up, put him over my head, lunged with him, and put him down. Mm. And I said, now please shut up about how strong you are. So yeah. when pictures of that started circulating, we also had a Navy SEAL in the class who was a badass, and he was like 210 pounds of solid muscle. He couldn't do it. Nobody could do it. Never had a single person do it yet. Mm. But I'll do it for them. And so I showed them. I said, that's why you're here in my class. Mm. Why don't you pay attention? You know? And so this spread like wildfire. So everywhere I went, radio shows everywhere, people were like, pick me up, put me over your head. Mm. Well, one time I landed after a long trip. It was at the end of a long penny, and I'd been on the road for months, and I was just exhausted. And three guys saw me coming into the, the conference. The hotel was in the conference center. I can't remember. I think it was in England. I can't remember where it was. I think it was in England. Um, and we had just been on a long flight and these guys begged me to do this. And I said, you know, I'm really tired. How about just find me tomorrow and I do it. And I told mm. them no about three times. But they were like, they're, they're following me to my hotel room. They were yeah. literally so desperate. So finally I said, okay, I'll do it. I said, and I, and I intuitively sensed, I said to this guy, now look, I'm going to throw you up in the air. And you're going to be way up in the air. I said, you got to keep your body rigid because I can't hold on to you if you let your body go. So you got to keep yourself stiff. Mm. And sure enough, I threw him up over his head. He, my head, he got scared and he buckled and he slipped through my hands and landed on my head oh. full force. And it side bent my neck to the right and it sounded like someone broke a baseball bat. And I felt lightning bolt shoot right through my whole body. And it blew two discs out, tore uh, several of the ligaments in my spine. Um, the left side of my body went numb. Uh, I lost 24 pounds of muscle in about four weeks due to atrophy. Mm. The whole left side of my body atrophied. Holy I, shit. I couldn't even carry a briefcase. I mean, I went from being a strong, highly skilled boxer, martial <laughs> artist, to a guy who couldn't protect himself against an angry 12-year-old. Mm. And so it completely blew my ego to pieces. I was like, who am I now? I mean, I don't, I, I can't defend myself. I I felt naked, like extremely naked and vulnerable. And so, and I, I I, couldn't lift heavy weights for a long time. I had so much pain in my neck. I used to wear through a bed sheet every couple of months. I'd literally wear holes in it because I would roll over in pain so much at night. And so it, it, it really forced me into a sort of a spiritual crisis where I had to really go deep into meditation and, and deeper contact with my soul. And first I asked, why did this happen to me? You know, and my soul said, you know, you've, you've gotten to the point where you're so reliant on your strength and power to prove your point that you're alienating as many people as you're attracting and you're attracting muscle heads and mm. and people to you that will emulate that but for you to really have an effect and do what you came to the world to do you've got to draw as many people as you can in and you don't want your students emulating that behavior or they're going to get rejected like you get rejected mm. and so my soul told me that i i needed to go through that to bring me to to balance the male and the female in me and to bring me into a space of teaching from my heart instead of just using my mind like a sword and, and using my body as um, proof mm. that I was yeah. right, but in a forceful way. Yeah. And so it was a quite a spiritual crisis. It, it took me about six years of rehabbing myself to get to yeah. where I could lift weights without a lot of pain and I wasn't having numbness in my arm and my, I mean, sometimes my arm would go so numb I couldn't even move it. Like it was dead. I literally would have to play around with my neck and mm. get my fingers in there and try to move the vertebra around and 
take the pressure off the spinal cord and yeah so it was it was a quite a um it was a spiritual crisis <laughs> that that's and it was the strangest thing because kind of like what you're alluding to people started coming up to me after lectures and saying paul you know i don't know what happened to you but mm. you're sure a lot easier to be around and you're not nearly as scary as you used to be and i didn't know i was scared people i mm. i just thought i was just telling it as it is you know mm. and but but people would tell me you used to scare me in lectures i was always afraid you might just <laughs> pounce on me or something yeah you feel like a black belt like in jiu-jitsu i've been doing jiu-jitsu for like eight years now and that's what it feels like it feels like a very someone who's done it for 50 years you know and you mm. just like you know you can't uh, you can't say anything you gotta and it does feel intimidating at times mm. but uh what i've felt is just i've always felt unconditional love from you at hlc too mm. this is uh nine years ago one morning you, you must have just felt my energy or something you walked up to me and you said proud of you buddy and gave me a hug mm-hmm. and man i was just like fuck he knows mm. <laughs> he knows how i'm feeling <laughs> it was um, a weird feeling i'm pretty capable of reading people. yeah you know, mm. look, I've been doing this for 40 years. Yeah. And I've been through a lot of hell myself. And I've probably done a thousand plant medicine ceremonies. And I've mm. helped thousands of people out of hell, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. And I think you should know by now, <laughs> I can read the body. I mean, that's what uh, I do for a living. It's, 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 that's what I mean. It is intimidating sometimes. Cause I remember you said to me, uh, you got a female upper body, you got a male lower body, or it might've been the reverse. He's like, you need to dance. You go, you need to dance more. He goes, you know, you know, dance, dance in life. He's like, you're too stuck, too rigid. Mm. And I was mm. like, fuck man, honestly, HLC too. I'm still learning from that course. <laughs> <laughs> it's been oh, good. <laughs> you got your money's worth. Yeah, I know. I know. And, uh, yeah, no, it's, uh, uh, you look, I've there's the story you just told. If you knew how many of them there was floating around yeah. out there, and a lot of the instructors were those people. Fucking I, that's why I'm here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I I, I could tell you. Well, Nicole Devaney, you know who Nicole Devaney yep. is? She was an ex professional pole dancer, stripper. You know, um, very beautiful, but. She would be in class with me, and she was so caught up in her physical appearance. Um, I knew that I had to help her out of that. Mm. And I pulled her aside and said, Nicole, you know, look, I'm going to be honest with you. You really need to stop using your body like a magnet, because the problem Mm. is what sticks to those breasts of yours is not what you want as a partner. It's It won't be the people that will make your life meaningful and rich. It'll be bottom feeders, body, mm. body magnets. And those don't ever make long-term healthy relationships. And, you know, there was other things too, but, I, but she listened. And she went from being your classic pole dancer to being one of the greatest teachers that's ever come through my system and Mm. becoming a shaman and an expert in herbology and you know like like this is a very well put together woman yeah but when i had her in my classes she was on the road to you know on the wrong road Mm. and um and 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 just you know endless stories like that because i it's my job to use my skills to tell people the truth. And I try to tell them the truth in a way that won't hurt them, mm. but gives them a choice to wake up and, you know, go stand in the mirror and have a good conversation <laughs> with themselves. Because yeah. there's very few people that, that have the ability to see the charades and know where they're going. Right. And when you've worked with as many elite athletes and movie stars and billionaires and moguls as I have, I've seen all the goddamn shows you can possibly (laughs) see. There was a time when I had, I think, eight, six or eight billionaires flying their private jets to see me because they were all Mm. fucked up at every level. Drug addicts, you know, you'd be amazed how many people with high, high levels of success and responsibility are addicted to cocaine and all sorts of shit, sex, Mm. you name it. Mm. 
so, you know, over the years, my reputation grew and I would have all these people. So the point is, you know, by the time someone like you standing in front of me or Nicole or any of these people, I already know how the video game of life works <laughs> and how the, these things can take you down really tough, lead you to a real tough experience of life. So mm. I, I also reached a level through my Tai Chi and working with Master Fong Ha that my clairvoyance was so powerful. I could... I had a hard time being around people because I could see all the traumas in their life. I could read their energy field and it was like I could see all the physical, emotional, and mental abuse from the beginning of their birth all the way. And some of the, so often, so many people carry such painful stories. Mm. It just broke my heart and I was just like holding the tears back, like saying to myself, how in the yeah. world do you want me to help all these people? It's like we're in a world full of broken lost souls and how i said you you know i so i said i need you to stop showing me all this only show me what you want me to see because i'm supposed to help that person tell me what i need to know so when i when i do something like i did to you mm. my soul probably said go tell jake this and when i hear that it means i have a responsibility to do that whether you like it or not that's the burden I have to carry. Some people yeah. don't want to hear the truth. A lot of people don't want to hear the truth. I, I think I came there to for a body state to to have a good body. Mm -hmm. And the first thing you said to me, you looked direct at me, you walked to me, and you said, "My soul's telling me to tell you to read this book, The Wisdom of Insecurity by Alan Watts." <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> and I go. read I read that book like three times. I was just like, "Yeah, it was it was crazy." That's I, exactly how it works. From yeah <laughs> exactly yeah and i hear stories all the time of people that say you know that one day you whispered in my ear was mm. the day that my life changed because mm. i knew you were telling me the truth and it's a lot of responsibility mm. for me you know it's yeah. a lot of responsibility um but i'll tell you what it's 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 helped me help a lot of people change their lives i, I can give you a, a, an example of this I was at a trade show, I was at a conference with a trade show, as there so often is, and one of our distributors, this was in Montreal, Canada, and one of our distributors came up to me between lectures, that just happened to be in the trade show area, and she said, one of the girls in my booth really loves your work, and she just bought a copy of How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, and she would love it if you would sign it for her. I said, sure, just bring me the book. And so she brought the book over, and I noticed the girl had written her name in it. Mm -hmm. And my soul said, connect to her soul. So I touched her handwriting. I never had met the girl. I hadn't even seen her. I touched her handwriting, and immediately I could feel that my, when I connected to the vibration of her, because your signature carries your soul vibration. It's like an antenna. I can touch anybody's handwriting and connect right to them. Mm -hmm. And so what happens, I just open myself up and let them into me. So because I'm very tuned to myself from many, many years of <clears throat> Tai Chi and <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> meditation and spiritual practices, I just empty myself and become like a mirror or a pond that's real still. And so as soon as I touch that signature, whatever happens to me is what's going on inside of them. So I'm like a... Uh, like a uh, you know oscilloscope that you hook up to something and all of a sudden it gives you a reading. And I said to her, wow, do you, do, 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 is this girl having serious problems with her small intestine and her colon? And, and so then I, she said, oh my God, she's on her way to surgery. Like, I think she's scheduled for surgery Monday. She's got serious, I think it may have been colitis or something like mm. that, but she's they're, they're going to cut a chunk of her colon out. And so I told her, <clears throat> this is why this is happening and this is what she needs to do and she doesn't need the surgery she just needs to do the following dietary changes and work on you know um, there's a bunch of psychological issues connected to these types of things so I just told her and, and like it just it freaked her out because she she this girl had been working for her for years she knew her she was a friend of hers and so I you know she was shocked that I could do that 
so she went and told the girl, and that blew the girl's mind. But, you know, these are the kinds of things that happen. Here's another example that was a kind of a wild one. I was with our UK distributor, Alex McKenzie, one time, and she had to get her tires changed on her car. So she drove her car, and you know how you go sit in the waiting room while they change the tires? And all of a sudden, I was just overwhelmed with the realization that whoever owned this tire shop's son had severe allergies to milk and to, to dairy. And there was a couple of other things in there mm. and that the kid was suffering from severe asthma as a side effect of it. <clears throat> that the kid was getting very, very sick, like, you know, dangerously sick. And of course was going in, you know, being in the hospital with doctors and that's mm. another dangerous road. <laughs> now, this is just a fucking tire shop. I mean, I, I... <laughs> so, I said to my soul, wow, do you really want me to do something about this? These people are going to think I'm freaking crazy if I go say something like this. And my soul said, yeah, do it. So I went up to the front desk and I said, "Could is the owner of this tire shop here? And they said, no, he's out right now. He's, um, I can't remember what they said he was doing. I said, does, does he have a, a little boy that's sick? And they said, yes. Why do you ask that? I said, I've got a message for him. And I said, do you have a piece of paper and a pen? And I wrote everything he needed to know down and just left it for him and left um, because I knew that if that, if those parents didn't understand what was going on, they would, this kid would probably get, end up getting sicker and die. And this, this is the kind of stuff that goes, happens all the time mm. in my life. You know, it's, it's a, it's so the point is it's a lot of responsibility it's ma it's magic <laughs> well it's magic but y you wouldn't believe how <clears throat> some people don't see it as magic they they react negatively to it and it's yeah. often not the people i'm helping it's the people around them yeah that's yeah. the that's the biggest thing from ims4 you uh, you came in one of the days and you you did that big talk on soul and connecting to your soul. He's like, mm. you've got to get smart enough to know this stuff, but then you've got to connect to your soul. Yeah. And uh, I've been testing that over the last couple of years. And last night, actually, I got a message from a girl saying, you know, when you told me to speak my truth, because she kept coughing, she kept, mm. and I could just feel something in her throat. And she said, I went home that day and I spoke all my truth to my husband. I left my husband. I went this way. And she's, mm -hmm. she's like, no, I haven't told you that. It was, that was probably about four months ago. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, fuck the timing of this. This is crazy. And, that's the biggest thing I've taken away from from level four is that oh, that tr that trusting that l that that feeling of just being your whole being gets lit up mm -hmm. when you're around them and that's where I've kind of strayed away for I'm get I felt like I was getting smarter but I was wasn't tapping in with that and that mm -hmm. I got some of the craziest results when I was a level one because I was more tapped into that mm -hmm. and now it's like that's you know that's where I'm going I, I, I this is why this you know conversation is so so awesome for me right now because i'm mm -hmm. just like fuck that's that's that just lights me up i just feel that in my, in my being mm -hmm. so it almost gives me goosebumps <laughs> well that's that's actually a form of unconditional love because you you know you're not calling that in it's like it's not like you're trying to do that <coughs> um you know these things come from the emptiness of God, mm. you know, it's not like you're walking around going, I've got to make sure I tell that girl this yeah, or whatever, yeah, yeah. you know, it just comes to it you, just comes to you yeah. like a lightning flash and there it is. And you know, you, you sense, okay, I have to do something with this. Um, but the, the point I'm making is it's not conjured up. No, it's not to get attention. And no. like I say, a lot of these things are scary to do. Like, you know, walking <laughs> up to a guy in a tire shop and saying, yeah, you know, a mechanic, <laughs> you know, telling them that and they're looking at me like what the f <laughs> Whoa, who is this crazy that's son crazy. of a bitch that's you know crazy. <laughs> and i've had a, a ton of these types of experiences and and you, you just it's a gift that you have to give without attachment yeah you know if they get upset at me or whatever i just say i've done my job you know i've delivered the mail you yeah. know you're not supposed to attack the mailman <laughs> because he brought you a bill that's his job yeah because he also brings you the checks yeah <laughs> <laughs> my dad he he had uh he made a lot of money when he was younger. He's from Melbourne, Melbourne Underground, where they, you know, like sh shoot him up days, you know, like real rough. And uh, he did a complete 180. He got throat cancer when he was, uh, I think it was early 50s. And he did a complete 180 and changed his whole life. He sold everything, moved into a caravan, and he lived a life of, his, his favorite quote was truth, love, and humility. 
mm. and he worked he volunteered with old people in the dying in uh harvey bay mm. and yeah it was the story i just love listening to his stories about like you know that he was he lived a life of service towards the end and i just saw how much happiness that brought him has, has that got green in it or is it no i don't smoke green oh, okay cool cool i only <laughs> smoke green when i'm finished with work <laughs> or <laughs> painting beautiful uh, my rule is don't use anything that stops you from getting your work done or you end up being a village <laughs> idiot and not having any money, which is one of the reasons I'm so concerned about <laughs> legalization of so many drugs. It yeah, yeah. makes it too easy for people to <laughs> cop out yeah. on themselves. Yeah. Oh, man. Uh, How old was your dad when he died? He was 65. Okay, so not yeah. much older than me. Yeah, and, and he was fit, man. He was like, he was fit. He, he kind of... He still went to the gym twice a week. I mean, he's not fit to your level, of course, but he was uh, he was a fit guy, and he, man, we had the deepest conversations. I'm just, he was my best friend at the end. He wasn't my father at the end, man. He felt more like a, a mm. best friend, you know. And oh, that's beautiful. Fuck, it's incredible, man. I was just so grateful for the time I had with it's him. It's a good model for you, dude. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Um, I forgot what I even wrote down because <laughs> well, it's just been flowing, man. <laughs> yeah, well, you you know, sometimes you gotta let spirit take over <laughs> that was my goal on the way here i i was like you know what spirit guide me guide me into some good deep chats with paul <laughs> yeah well you're getting them <laughs> yeah um <clears throat> on that note how what do you feel what do you feel from me now after uh, i'll be interested to, s to, f to see what you feel from my energy field now you know being 10 years ago i think you found yourself mm. um I, I think you're in a spiritual blossoming phase. Um, I haven't tried to read you or anything, no. but I'll just feel. I still feel, you know, you, you're young, so you've got a strong connection to the earth, which is important. Um, I really think that you're at the point in your life where you... You're learning about the nature of impermanence. Yes. You know, Buddha said the only... Mm. Universal law is impermanence. That's the fuck. spot on, man. So, um, and I don't. It's it's so fitting. The last two weeks, that's that's been on my mind. You know, dealing with with that and and that exact thing, the nature of impermanence. I'm just mm. just thinking about it a lot. Like, yeah. So my soul said to tell you that just try to bring your consciousness to your heart and remember this as your guiding motto. Use your heart to feel what you know, not, um, yeah. you know, you have to always find this balance between making money and dealing with the tangible physical realities and responsibilities. But, you know, like COVID would be a great example of when using your heart to feel what you know, no matter how much pressure you are under. And if your heart says, no, don't do that, don't let any other part of yourself get into the equation because mm. it's dangerous. Mm. And so, you know, the heart is metaphorically the home of the soul because the soul is really God. The soul is what you and God create together. 
the rest of it doesn't matter. When you die, you, mm. all you can take with you is what you've become. <laughs> you know, Jesus in the Bible says, a rich man can no sooner get to heaven than a camel can get through the eye of a needle. Why? Because you can't take gold with you when you go. <laughs> you can't take cars and castles and jewelry and stuff, you know. So I think, you know, you're at the place in your own development now, which is quite accelerated because you're not, what are you, 30? 30? 33. 33, you know. Yes, you know, when Jesus died. <laughs> um. um You're you're at the place now where you're kind of on an early transition compared to most people out of your ego into higher connection with your soul and your highest self. Your highest self isn't your soul. It, it's it's fused with your soul, but it's it's really God's dreaming you into existence. So the higher self is like the perfected Jake, and it acts like a strange attractor like a magnet and it's pulling you through the material realm mm. um it, the body entangles the spirit and the soul uh, you know like um you think of a magnetic field it's very hard to get out of a magnet right yeah <laughs> but the the consciousness that we are is god consciousness and it's fused into the body like a magnetic field is fused into a magnet. Mm. But the difference is, is that the soul can actually leave the magnet. Most people don't realize that till they die. Then all of a sudden they go, wow, my body's dead, but here I am talking to myself. Mm -hmm. And so spirit is like electricity and soul is like magnetism. And those two go together always. One creates the other. So as you go into spiritual growth, you begin to have experiences of yourself in and as other things. It mm. could be all of a sudden you're next to a stream and you find yourself one with the stream and everything in it is talking to you. Mm. And you realize, wow, this whole thing's alive. Fuck. You know, like... yeah. I work with rocks a lot, as you know, and the rocks will talk to me and they'll say, oh, put me here. I want to be here. I go here. And they'll tell me exactly what to do. Or when I paint, I'll, I'll just let my soul paint. And, 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 and I'll paint things that I don't even know how I did it because I can't paint like that. I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool because I don't know how I did that. So you're at the point now where it, it's... The transition is from trusting and letting your, excuse me, your head guide you to letting your heart guide you. So, yeah. you know, just remember, use your heart to feel what you know. And if you make decisions from there, and it helps to put your hand over your heart whenever you're needing mm. to deal with things that are challenging or you're not sure what to do with people, because it helps you sense where you need to bring your consciousness to. Mm. So, you know, if you, like, you can be listening to me from your head, but if you bring your consciousness to your heart, you can also feel the vibration of my voice or anybody else's voices affecting you in your heart. And you will have a much deeper sense of which direction to go. Uh, for example, there can be times where going one direction seems like it could make you a lot of money. Hmm. Like, I've had that a lot of times in my <laughs> life. But, for example, I, I was told over and over again and offered, Paul, why don't you start a Swiss ball factory? You'll make millions. Hmm. Because I really pioneered the whole damn thing, right? Hmm. Um, I could tell you all sorts of stories about that. But I could have made millions. But my soul said, that's not what you're here to do. Hmm. You came here to teach people how to live holistically and how to um, marry the physical life with the spiritual life so that it's meaningful and so that people evolve. They don't just end up in a nice house with a nice car, with a nice girl, with a pair of, uh, you know, silicone perfect titties, <laughs> titties. and, uh, you know, bleached white teeth and all yeah. the things that look nice yeah. but ultimately lead to emptiness, right? And so... um That that's sort of the the next stage of evolution is you'll have to navigate 
I feel that massively. These, these yeah. things, and mm. you know, any one of these things, your your podcast could get very successful. Then you'll have all sorts of stuff thrown at you, and yeah. it just goes on and on and on. And so, the thing that's been my greatest ally is is my heart and learning to make decisions from there. And it sounds easy, but it's a practice because the ego's got a real stranglehold on us. Yeah, yeah. Ramdas teaches this one where you act like you got nostrils in your in your chest, and it's funny because I've been doing that the last couple of weeks. So I've been here at night to get to sleep. Mm. Don't know what it is for, but for since Dad, my heart's been pounding, and I was just like breathing, breathing, trying to breathe into my heart. That's been my main meditations. Well, your heart's probably pounding because <laughs> your father's trying to get your attention. Yeah. that's what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what that is. So you, you need to do is you just need to listen. Yeah. <clears throat> empty your mind. Yeah. And just say, Dad, if that's you, I'm listening. Talk to me. And when you stop thinking, see, if your thinking's an active process, if I say, Jake, what's 256 times 3, you have to go into an active process and you can feel yourself thinking. So if you're not thinking, and all of a sudden you hear a voice say, I'm here, mm. and I've always been here since I left, mm. and it starts talking to you, as long as you're holding your focus on your father, you'll know, because you can say to your dad, okay, well, if just to make sure that's you, tell me what you gave me when I was seven or something, mm. you know, something that only he could know. That's how you can <laughs> confirm that. Yeah. So that that is probably your reaction to the sense of your father's presence it's very likely to be what it is mm. <laughs> cheers a <Aho>. hope <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh man yeah oh thank you oh. where are we where are we at <laughs> we're on rainbow yeah <laughs> So what's what's next next for Mr. Paul Check? <laughs> well, you know, I've been working hard, hard, hard for three years to launch my magnum opus, which will which is Spirit, Spirit Gym. Gym. Mm -hmm. Man, I'm excited for that. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's a huge project, um, biggest project in my life. So um, you know, Matt's the editor, and and Penny's kind of the manager of it, and uh, um, I have a. a financial backer who's one of my clients it was actually her that <laughs> said why haven't you got this out there yet actually what happened <laughs> was she came to me in a midlife crisis and she was really quite stuck and two years into therapy we were right here in this room and we had just finished her she just finished painting her myth and i had just broken her whole myth down on on the whiteboard that's back there and i explained what her myth means because she did the process of creating her myth and I explained it to her mm. and she just had tears in her eyes and she looked at me and she said, Paul, I want you to know I am no longer in a midlife crisis. And then out of the blue, she said, is this the kind of stuff you're going to teach people in spirit gym like you've been doing with me? I said, that's exactly what spirit gym is. And she goes, well, why is it not out there yet? I said, I can give you about 400,000 reasons why. Because, <laughs> you know, it's going to cost me that much to have the time mm -hmm. and to do have a have to have a professional artist, I have to have an editor. I mean it's a very expensive project to do. And this is not like your typical paperback book. This is like a glossy and it's mm -hmm. a series of books. It's it's probably now gonna be we've recently decided to shorten the books so they're easier to read. So it's a forty chapter yeah. process. So we were going to do six volumes of 350 pages each, but now we're going to go down and break it down to, because each chapter is like a small book. Yeah. So now it's probably going to be more like 18 smaller volumes. Um, but she said, what do you need? I'll write you a check. So her and I sat down with Penny and we did a deal because I want to make sure she gets fair compensation and... So out of the blue, you're my, right. my <laughs> angel showed up. And that's what happens when you're really Fuck. doing what I call God's work. You know, the angels come to, to support you. So um, I'm, I've written 34 of the 40 chapters, but I have so much responsibility all the time. And 
teaching classes and filming and running the podcast as a full-time job all by itself. And uh, so we're hoping to launch that as fast as possible now. So we're, we have enough to get the first uh, probably two volumes into layout and then we'll launch the website with the launch of the first one. So it's a membership program cool. where I actually teach people how to apply the principles in Spirit Gym in a daily practice. And so each week I'll be doing a presentation, kind of like when you go to church and you, you, mm. you get a sermon or a lecture from the pastor or whatever. Mm. Uh, so I will take a chunk of Spirit Gym and talk about that. And then the next hour will be anyone in the audience that's having a problem of any type, physical, emotional, mental. I'll bring them up and I'll say, okay, here's how you use the principles to address your specific issue. And I'll get to where I can get to them, and I'll say, okay, your homework is go do the following, and then come back next week, and we'll go from there. So I'm going to teach everybody in the membership by letting them be part of everybody else's life, Mm. how they use these principles, but by... You know, seeing someone who's going through a divorce and how I address that, and someone who's got a disease and how I address that, and someone who's got this problem and that problem. So everybody get, <clears throat> excuse me, gets to go for the ride with each other. So we cross educate each other, and the goal is to <clears throat> create a wave of of people that actually have a high enough level of consciousness and can work with the much higher truths of the nature of mm-hmm. God, which takes an adult to handle. Uh, most people don't really want to know the truth about God. They want, you know, God to be the big daddy in the sky that rescues them from themselves <laughs> all the time and that kind of stuff. But God's a lot more, fuck, tricky than that. Uh, tricky, you know, yeah, God's very complicated. <laughs> Paradoxically, the most simple yet the most complicated thing there is, and um, that that in the podcast is how I kind of plan to finish my career. Because I mean, I've seen so many patients now; it's like it doesn't excite me anymore. It's like a broken mm-hmm. record. I've seen every <laughs> under thing under yeah. the sun. You know, it's just like okay. And I, I got to the point where I felt like I was just kind of like. You know, Groundhog Day. Yeah. It's like, it was like when I was on the road lecturing. It's like, if I have to talk about Swiss balls and horse dance exercises and deadlifts anymore, <laughs> I'm going to go goddamn crazy. And yeah. so, you know, the instructor's job is to do that. And so... Yeah, you've leveled, leveled up massively. I have to yeah. keep climbing at my own level, you see. <clears> so... Um, it seems like that, too, from, from the outside, from being all the way over in Australia and seeing, like, your Reacts videos, all the content you're putting out. That's like... I can just see how that helps people on such a grand scale. Yeah. And that's Spirit Gym too. Like That's a more effective use of my time. It's a huge offering. Yeah. And I also am in a position where I have to make a lot of money to keep everything running. So yeah. um, if I'm working on one client, even at my rate of seven fifty an hour, I can't make that much money. Um, you know, I can probably make, if I work full time, I can make about half a million a year. Doing but clients, yeah. Doing clients, but <laughs> mm. but then I've only helped one person directly. If I put that money into Spirit Gym, I can help millions of people. Yeah. So I I have a, a moral responsibility to make decisions about how I make money to feed my family and take care of the business because if I do it with one-offs and things that don't actually have a ripple effect, mm. I'm 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 sort of. Um, I'm stifling my own legacy. I'm I'm not I have to carry the pain of knowing I'm not doing what I came here to do and what I'm supposed to be doing at this time in my life. It'd be kind of like the 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 CEO of, you know, it would be like if Steve Jobs was alive and and you walked to Apple and you found him in the in the shop fixing broken phones mm-hmm. instead of, you know, taking us to the next level of technology. It would be mm-hmm. like, what are you doing in here? Yeah. You know, you're at the wrong end of the animal here. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the the head is stuck down in the tail kind of thing. So for me, it's really just about, um, you know, using everything I have learned to, you know, that, which is why I wrote my book, How to Eat, Move, and Be Healthy, for example. It's like, I'm, like I keep seeing people come with the same problems over and over again. I was like, okay, how come nobody knows how to eat? Nobody knows how to exercise. Nobody knows how to breathe. Nobody knows that 
what constipation is and what to do with it. Well, you know, when he knows what the importance of water is. Everybody uses microwave ovens. They don't realize that's messing them up. Everybody keeps running to medical doctors to drug the symptoms that are guiding them to what they need to stop doing to themselves. Mm. And so I felt like, okay, it, you know, I would die before I could even touch the mass of the population that's lost and confused. But for, so if I can put a book out there for $25, it's like your operator's manual, then I can help lots of people and we've sold i don't know probably 220,000 copies of that book and we published it ourselves yeah so you know the number of letters i've gotten from people that have had their whole family transform and gotten off of medical drugs and healed diseases it's <laughs> like okay that was what i was supposed to do yeah. and so i'm just at that point now i mean i've written 11 books already this this will kind of be about i think this is after this i just want to rest i don't whatever yeah. life i have left i just want to paint and hang out with my kids and you know um, I think my kids are going to get into things. You know, Zoe might end up being a gymnast. She's just a, you know, she's very naturally talented at gymnastics, and um, Mana's got all sorts of talents. But um, I didn't get to spend much time with my first son because I was so focused on my career, and I was so young. He was born when I just turned eighteen, so I had this drive of I got to feed my family and I got to make something out of myself. Yeah. So I was so hell bent for leather that he got the short end of the stick because I was, you know, extremely focused. I had this survival drive in me and I came from a family that was very broken and always had money problems. And I didn't want that for him. But now, you know, Mana came when I was 56 and uh, I think 54, maybe he's seven now. And Zoe's mm. four. Um, but I want to, um, and I still work a lot and I still, you know, struggle to spend enough time with them. But fortunately, they, you know, they have two mothers and they have nannies and, and I do spend time with them each day. But mm -hmm. when I can get my career to the point where I don't have to focus on my career so much, then I want to just be their corner man. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I can feel that coming off the spirit gym. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty, which, you know, and, and I, I just kind of want to, I, I don't, I'm not one of these guys that wants to live to be 120 or any of these kind of new age, you know, yeah. anti biohacking, what are the, yeah, <laughs> you know, anti aging type people. No. I just want to finish what I came to the world to do and, and wait until my kids have an operating system. And then whenever mm. it's time to go, I'm like, all right, get me out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. you know? That's so good that you said the other day, the quickest the quickest way to growth is having two partners. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you want a rapid spiritual evolution, just uh, have two women that you, you know, two wives, you know. I have two wives and, you know, you, you, you have to grow. It's a, not only is it how well you get along with either of them, it's how well they get along and how the two of them get along with you. You know, it's a, one extra person adds a lot of dynamics. It goes beyond okay. just the number one. You know, there's yeah. a lot of complexities and um, needs, and um, it's just, yeah, it's a it's a rapid acceleration. But I wouldn't have it any other way. Mm. I, I mean, we we have such an amazing relationship between the three of us, and the kids are the you know, real winners. I mean, they've, yeah. they've got, <clears throat> you can two, see that two super smart mommies and, um, just such a beautiful, I mean, my kids have the complete opposite childhood to what I have. Absolutely the opposite. And that's my dream for them. I really want to give them every opportunity to follow their soul. And I mean, I know what they're here to do because their souls came to me and told me, <laughs> told me why they chose us and what they're coming to the world to do. And I also know the world's, <laughs> right on the edge of going through some really bumpy times mm. and both of their souls told me they've they're coming to help with that transition so i kn i know that i have to get them ready for you know you know we're in a we're we're like in the closing of one chapter mm. of human life and we're in the beginning of another chapter and there's there's going to be a struggle letting go of the story yeah, it feels like that. Eh? Yeah, so you know, you can see the what the environment's like. You can see, you know, we've got to figure out how to, you know, shake this the the daddy figure. 
patriarchal mm. control model because yeah. it's killing the whole planet. Yeah. Us and the planet. And uh, so, you know, it's like if you buy an old house, but it's going to cost more to fix it than it's worth. You got to bulldoze it. Yeah, yeah. You got to take it down, right? Yeah. Or an old building. You got to yeah. implode the damn thing and pick up the scraps and start new. And we're we're at the point with the the capitalistic consumeristic model. It's killing the planet and it's destroying our minds and it's it's stopping us from really realizing what's valuable in life. Everybody's so in love with stuff, you know. Yeah. Um, our myth has to change or we're we're, we're, we're going to kill everything i mean we're going to put the planet into a state of having to get rid of us to recover and uh you know the planet is is devoted to being a schoolyard for souls so um the planet's own consciousness is working on rectifying things let alone our consciousness but um you know chaos Chaos always uh, precedes change, and so we're we're COVID was the beginning of a big transition period where we all collectively have to decide what kind of an existence we want moving forward. You you either be passive and you become slave to the mm. dark forces of globalism, <clears throat> or you stand in your independence and get clear on what we all need. We all need food. We all need water. We need healthy soils. We need clean air. Uh, so we got to get rid of a lot of things from geoengineering to bogus medicine to uh, police that's not police force, it's not for justice, it's a criminal organization. Yeah. Um, you know, all the things you already know about, but, um, you know, I think that's part of why Spirit Gym is so important because I have to be able to share the tools that people are going to need to mentally, emotionally self-manage um mm. uh, that's our goal too man that's that's yeah. why we started corrective culture mm. cindy o'meara who you know how you had your person who came and helped you with spirit gym we had cindy o'meara who's 65 i believe and she lives in australia mm -hmm. just an amazing woman like yeah uh, all into uh regenerative farming everything like that's got a huge farm massive following great she just came to us and said you guys got to make supp supplements out mm. of nowhere and that's just turned what we had as just taking clients every single day into a massive conglomerate of like helping much more people yeah and we just want to spread the word of like you know good farming water everything everything yeah. that you teach man and that's yeah. why with the czech institute we we just pump it man because we're just like that's that's what we believe in that's 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 the shit <laughs> well, you know, it, 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 look, it's <clears throat> many people have said to me, you know, because I've been in a lot of debates in my career and often up against people with, you know, multiple PhDs. And many people have said to me, aren't you afraid to debate these guys? If you lose, it could be very damaging to you and your institute. And I'm going, no, I'm not afraid. And it's pretty hard to beat a guy who is saying you have to take care of the earth. You can't understand nutrition if you don't understand the soil. You have to breathe. You have to move. You know, you have to be clear about what happiness is. You've got to move mm. your body. You've got to eat for your individual needs and quit reading stupid diet books because most of the people that wrote them are sick anyhow. And you've got to learn how to rest and you have to have a, a, some sort of a, a practice of introspection mm. or, and self-reflection or you'll just keep being the same idiot you ever were wondering why everybody else is so mean to you when not realizing you're 50% of the equation. <laughs> And so uh, my point is it's it's very hard to debate against what o what's so obvious. <laughs> yeah, it's know, like, that's what I that's how I feel. It's like someone debating me that we don't need to drink water. Yeah. Okay, well, yeah, let me see you go for a week without water. <laughs> then if you do that and you're still as healthy as you were before, then you win the debate. But, you know, so I, that's, that's not a debate I'm going to lose. So you know, my point is the Czech Institute is built on anatomy, physiology, um, true spirituality and um the in the reality of of ecosystems and and how we interface with nature mm. it's not take this pill it's not you know biohacking it's that's one of the challenges is is that's one of the things that, you know because many people say paul you know your your teachings are so incredibly good why is it that the institute isn't a lot bigger 
Mm. And the answer is, is because the Institute teaches you that you are responsible and that you have to do the work and that you have to stop running to doctors for pills when you need to get involved in your own life and you have to stop relying on mommy and daddy figures to think for you and you've got to actually learn to think for yourself and solve problems and become a co-creator instead of just being passive about it mm. and most people are too lazy to do what i teach they just want someone to fix them you know yeah. and so that's the great limiter on my system is it is totally dependent upon you <laughs> and one of the the most common criticisms I get is that I'm running a cult. And I laugh like hell when I hear that. I'm like, okay, well, first of all, you obviously don't know what a cult is. Second of all, cult leaders always take total control of their members. Third of all, they always have some kind of a dogma that they're giving, you know, no matter who it is. And finally, I teach people utter independence. I teach them to think for themselves, follow their heart, create their own dreams, take mm. responsibility for their challenges and their problems, and go out in the world and grow up and contribute to the world and make something beautiful out of yourself and share it with people. <laughs> I mean, that's that's not a cult leader <laughs> yeah, at yeah. all. <laughs> in fact, that's the opposite of religion. That's the opposite of cults. So, you, you know, you can see how the people that are in cults and often don't even know that they're culted Mm. use that terminology against me just like uh, anytime you tell the truth about what's going on with COVID or anything, they say you're giving medical misinformation or mm. some other thing, right? Mm. That's sort of like, you know, dirty tricks to get rid of the truth. So I, I just, I, I, I look at the whole thing and just kind of giggle. But, yeah. you know, the thing is too, is, you know, to do what I'm doing takes people like you. It takes people that are awake enough to say it's obvious what, Paul's teaching you know it's, it's obvious how he's helping me with my own life he's not you know trying to sell me on a, a monthly uh, subscription to uh, take something that'll make my dick hard forever or whatever you know all mm. the gimmicks out there and um, my point is as is, is I've said I kind of borrowed this from Osho I didn't come here to train the masses I came here to train to create masters and, you know, I could have made millions running a basic personal trainer certification that mm. any ding dong could pass and, you know, run the cash register day and night. Here, take your 75 multiple, cho 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 multiple choice questionnaire on like a lot of them do. And, yeah. and, you know, just being ding, 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 look at all the money I got. All these people <laughs> out there think they're personal trainers now and they're just killing everybody. Mm. Um, so my point is, is that it's actually people like you that are smart enough to see, okay, look, there, this guy's not trying to sell us a bunch of bullshit. It's just teaching us how to take care of ourselves and share that with other people. So mm. it, it is all the young, not, and it's not just young. I mean, I get people coming, leaving careers and I've, oh, I've yeah. had people in my programs that are 75 years old that mm. see the obviousness of it and they're retired. They don't need to work. They come and become HLC coaches and, check practitioners and join the academy. So it's it's really um, what I've done is I've created an opportunity for people that are ready to actually contribute to their own lives and to the world to step yeah. up and to think for themselves and create their own relationship with God. Qu quit reading books about God. Yeah. Create your own relationship with your diet. Quit you know, listening to books that tell you you got to be a keto person or mm. a vegetarian or a vegan or a a carnivore or whatever. I mean, all that stuff is, it, it's, it's so partial and it's so temporary. I mean, you know, the amount of sick vegetarians that I've had as patients is just a long, long list. It'll, mm -hmm. it'll, when I tell them they need to eat meat, they sit there and argue with me and tell me how perfect the vegetarian diet is and how healthy it is. And I have to remind them, why are you sitting in that chair paying me $750 an hour right now? Cause you got cancer. Mm. Or your adrenals are burned out, or you're you got irritable bowel syndrome, or any number of things. I'm mm. like, so you are, have you forgotten that you are the evidence of your own philosophy, and I'm offering you an opportunity to actually get healthy, and upgrade your software, and start paying attention to your body instead of being part of a ism, mm. which is a cult. Yeah, and think for yourself. Yeah, and so you know, 
you, you have to be an individual to think for yourself. And if you're not ready to validate yourself, love yourself, and accept yourself, you're always going to be codependent on somebody else's approval for love, validation, and a sense of meaning. And that means you're always under the control of someone else's ideas, mm. which means you're a child. You're in the child yeah. archetype. And the world cannot carry any more children. No. Uh, you know, we, we have, you know, Ken Wilber says about 70% of the people in the world have psychologically not evolved past dogmatic religion and being told what to do, which means they're in the child archetype. Mm-hmm. That's too many people. Native mm-hmm. tribes had rites of passage for mm-hmm. young men because they they had to become warriors and contributors to protect the tribe. There's three things we always have to do. We have to feed, we have to nurture, and we have to protect. So to survive as a human being, you have to feed everybody, you have to nurture the children and grow them, and you have to protect everybody. Well, when you get to the point where you have a world full of people that are eating... Mm. that are always looking for digital nurture and don't have effective parenting anymore and don't have anybody to protect them, you have a killing ground for those that know how to manipulate the environment and people's minds. Mm. And that's the beginning of the end, and here we all are. (laughs) So really what I did is I created an institute to teach you how to feed yourself, Mm how to nurture yourself and other people and nature and protect what's important. Yeah, well, that, Callan says, uh, my business partner, he says, he thinks the Czech Institute is the is the way to get through life with the most, the least most problems. Yeah. Like, and, you know, the four doctor model, everything that we use, we really, it's like that for me. It's, it's man, the, the, the road, I would have been a different road, put it that way, if I didn't start this stuff. Yeah. And, man, I'm just, oh, yeah, we're, we're so grateful. We're so great. One love. Mm. What do I love enough to change for? Mm-hmm. Two forces. The whole universe is created out of the feminine yin and the masculine yang. And if you're out of balance, it'll bite you. Yeah. So where are you out of balance? What choices are you willing to make to live your dream and heal yourself and become? And four doctors. Mm-hmm. Right. You cannot escape that. Mm. I don't care who you are. There's no. there's no way you can escape that. No. Um, you know, you can't be a three doctor person and be healthy <laughs> yeah. it's, you know it's uh it's, it's a four spoked wheel and you knock one spoke out and your wheel's not round anymore you knock yeah. two out you're dead stuck you knock three out you're dead mm. so you know i did my very best to take the depth and complexity of my teachings and bring it down so that no matter who you are from a six-year-old to a 95 year old you can look at those four doctors and I can teach it to a six-year-old. I can teach it to a professor in a university. I can teach it to a rocket scientist. I can teach it to an expert in biomechanics, kinesiology, nutrition. And nobody escapes the web of that four doctor Mm. model because none of us are likely to be enlightened in all four of those areas and i still have to watch myself constantly like i told you guys my big mm-hmm. battle is dr quiet <laughs> what's your what's your dr quiet look like for you now like like i know you do cold plunges you sauna you still practicing tai chi every yeah, day and yeah i've i've i do a lot of different techniques because i'm always working with different skill sets and practicing them so i know how to apply them Uh, in work with my patients like if I didn't have a toolbox of those things and I only had one work in tool there'd be a lot of people that didn't jive with it like Mm. you know if you only taught seated meditation you'd lose all the kinesthetic people and the people Mm. that are too wound up to sit still so that's what got me into the whole work in concept I needed dynamic meditation Mm. Uh, but the answer is you know Dr. Quiet for me is um, I take time each day to meditate I meditate in the sauna I spent a lot of time talking to my soul in the sauna saying, you know, what do I do about this? How do I handle this? You know, what do I need to do to help the world? Um, I did Tai Chi uh, every day, sometimes twice a day for 18 years. And then I just felt like it was time for me to put more time in other practices. And then recently I just came back to using my Tai Chi ruler, but I also practiced tarot every day. Mm. And tarot, I think, is a fantastic way to learn to let your soul guide you. And it, it, there's, I could go on for hours on tarot. 
But um, and I always laugh when the Christians say that's devil's work. I say, oh, <laughs> of course it is. Anything that gives you the responsibility of using your own mind and connecting to your own soul and letting your soul. See, the beautiful thing about tarot is that the 78 cards are like an alphabet. And, you know, saying tarot, tarot is the devil's work is like saying the alphabet is devil's work. Mm-hmm. I say, okay, well, good. Let me see you communicate without it. You know, mm. so your soul can actually begin to communicate with you through those archetypes. And the more you use them, the more you realize what it means and and what the possibilities are. Like any one of those cards can have a number of meanings. Mm. So as your intuition grows and your ability to communicate with your soul go, any one card you can say, okay, that's a trouble card. What's going to happen today that I need to be aware of? And how should I um, manage myself when this event comes? And then you, you get guided. So my point is, Tarot is a big part of my morning practice, and it can range from 20 minutes a day. Today it was an hour, and probably an hour and 20 minutes mm. that I spent just uh, due to the nature of the draw and what I was working with. Um, so th- those are the key things that I do in the morning. And then my biggest challenge is just getting enough sleep because uh, I wake up like clockwork at 3.30 in the morning. I mean, I have so much Fuck. I'm trying to get out of yeah. me before the shit hits the fan metaphorically so that I can help people before they're too freaked out. Um, it doesn't matter if I went to bed at 3 o'clock, I'd wake up at 3.30. Really? Yeah, I've always had this um, internal soul pressure mm. uh, for a, m- almost all my whole life. Uh I've had I've known that I came to the world to do this work for a very long time, mm. and so it's kind of like I have an internal assignment, <laughs> a spiritual assignment, mm. and I know that you know I'm only going to be here for a certain amount of time. So I've got to I got to make every day productive. Or um, that's what it seems like seeing yeah. you. You know, doing ten days here, seeing you work. Yeah, <laughs> it's just like fuck. Yeah, you got a lot going on, but you seem to be managing. You look healthy you know you managing it it's like it's so inspiring when i get home i'm just like i'm, I'm fucking inspired you know? well you know i i do practice everything i teach yeah i know, know? I, I i really do i mean mm. that's why i gave you a little demonstration in the gym <laughs> oh, I said, okay you young fuckers you <laughs> don't forget i'm an old man so here's some homework for you <laughs> yeah and uh that's my new goal one arm chins <laughs> yeah <laughs> i mean you know it's like Love is very, very powerful, and you know it can it can overwhelm you. I mean, it's, mm. it's it's like having a dragon inside of you, and you. It's hard for me because uh, you know my kids want time with me, my wives want time with me. Penny's fine; she's really just like me. She's just mm. straight ahead, you know. Yeah. Um, but Angie and the kids need more contact time. Um, so I, I really, I really have to work hard to balance that find how do i get out of this soul thrust and work to creative thrust all the time to stop and and not constantly have this feeling like i, I gotta go work i gotta you know i'm, I'm kind of like a doctor that's got a lot of patients mm-hmm. that need help and i'm say, taking a coffee break but i can hear them screaming down the hall you know <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah yeah it, it is a really interesting um it's really an <laughs> interesting experience. It's, but the, you know, so the thing is, is I watch myself. I monitor. You have to be careful in the gym. I got to be careful if I'm lifting heavy rocks. So if I'm not getting enough sleep, it's easy to get hurt. Mm. When, you, when you work like I do, and you have uh, the athletic ability that I have, you're very sensitive to deficits. Mm. Uh, if I eat, you know. I used to like to eat popcorn once a week with the kids, and mm. but my body hates corn, period. It hates, yep. hates all nuts, grains, and seeds. It just reacts negatively. But if I eat popcorn, for example, and watch a movie, I, I have three or four days where I've got to be very careful lifting heavy stuff because it mm. shuts, inflames my guts and shuts my core down, and I, you can easily blow a lumbar disc or you know lifting heavy like I'm lifting. Mm. You can hurt yourself bad. Point being is I'm always really tuning into my body and I will ask my soul what exercises should I do or not do, how heavy should I go or not go. And um, 
when I listen, I do good. But when I <laughs> when I start thinking, um, this is what I'm going to do today. You know, this is what I want to do. That's when I put myself at risk, and I've had to learn that. Rocks rocks taught me a lot about the danger of your ego guiding you. It's like. Mm. You know, I've almost died a couple times out there. <laughs> having, Some big rocks out there. Yeah, and having stacks come over and damn near kill me. I've smashed fingers and mm. a lot. I won't go through all the energy, but I've left a lot of blood out there. And mm. it's like, I, like I still have an ego. You know, I still got an mm. ego to manage. And <laughs> the paradox of it, I didn't have a, the strength of ego that I did. I never would have made the journey because all the naysayers would have deflated my sense of self and my self-confidence too much so i kind of needed the ego of a warrior of a of a mm. boxer a kickboxer a motocross racer you know mm. which is what i really am yeah and i'm a you know that's the kind of core i was a paratrooper in the 82nd airborne division you know mm. that's not a group of pussies there yeah you, know? you, you don't make it to that level as a soldier unless you can put up with some shit mm. and, and deliver the goods <laughs> yeah and I fought on the third best amateur boxing team in the world. And that was not an easy thing. You don't just mm. walk onto that team. You got to beat somebody <laughs> on it. And it's, you know, they're waiting for you. Yeah. They always love the tryouts. Who do we get to murder today? Yeah. You know, and, um, my point is, is that I have a deep enough relationship with my soul that if I am pushing hard with my work, I know how to back the exercise down. I know how to modify the diet. I know how to use natural tools like grounding myself to the earth with Tai Chi or going on a meditation walk mm. or more time in the cold plunge or more time in the sauna. Um, you know, I've spent my whole life working with these principles. So, and I know not to bullshit myself. Mm. Like that's the most dangerous thing you can do. Mm. I don't know if you ever saw my series on YouTube called "The Fastest Way to Health." I probably watched it. I would say probably yeah, most yeah. people. You know, most people that are interested in health have. But the first mm. thing I say right at the beginning is the fastest way to health is to stop bullshitting yourself. Yeah, and that's true. So, is that the is that the five part series? It's a six part. Six series. part. Yeah, actually, yeah. I, so funny. I watched the f uh, first one of that this morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I say the first thing you got to do is stop bullshitting yourself. Yeah. So I never bullshit myself. I mean, you know, I know how to read my body very well, and if it's tired, it's tired. If I eat in too much of one thing, and and I also have a personality where like I like I'll, I like to go whole hog. I can't eat one piece of pie. <laughs> if a pie tastes good I want to eat the whole damn thing uh, one piece of chocolate that's hard for me to do I want to eat the whole chocolate bar one espresso I am I want four um, you know mm. if I'm going to do a plant medicine ceremony I, I don't want to do anything light I want to go <laughs> hang out with God blow my ego the fuck out of the ballpark mm. um, you know so my point is, is I have to watch myself because I'm kind of like the motocross racer that's mm. going to do anything to cross the finish line <laughs> first, whether it be eating the pie or eating the yeah. chocolate or, you know, making love, whatever. I want to go full on, full on. Yeah, yeah. So you have to, I have had to learn to pull myself back because, uh, you know, the times that I haven't is when I've gotten hurt. Mm. And sometimes badly, you know. Yeah. I have plenty of reminders in my body. <laughs> yeah. Any broken bones and f holes in my skull and visceral internal bleeding and, you know, things that made mm. me go, oh, you know, that was, that was really <laughs> stupid of yourself. <laughs> yeah. I feel you on that one. I, mm. I used to jump cars on my skateboard and mm -hmm. just like the universe went, no, 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 no. Time to, st time to calm it down. I got yeah. a, I got one more question for you. Yeah. Uh, so when you were uh, in a monogamous relationship, yeah. uh, you were, you ha did you always feel the desire or the need for more women? Or did you... I just felt it was very unnatural for me to be in a monogamous relationship. Um, I, 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 For me, with I love women. You know, my mother was a real foundation in my life. I just, you know, I think women are just a tremendous expression of God. I yeah. really do. I mean, they're very powerful. Um, you know, both my wives are super intelligent. Mm. very capable, very powerful women that are much smarter than me in many different areas and much more capable than me. And that's what I've always wanted around me is women that can help me grow. So many men want, you know, women that they can just dominate. And I think that that's just, um, 
that's like being satisfied with third grade and not finishing school kind of thing. <laughs> mm. You know, it's like, okay, you think you're smart, but you're only in third grade. Yeah. Um, but for me, having sexual intimacy with somebody that you have a natural love and they have you, uh, it seems like it's just what's natural. And, and mm. it's, it's, it's an extension of love. Um, sex hasn't ever been something for me just like, you know, a lot of people just want to, you know, watch porn and get their rocks off. Uh, sex for me is like a deep penetration into the mystery of the other. Hmm. And, you know, I've been blessed to have, uh, you know, a, a pretty good amount of sex with a lot of really <laughs> beautiful women. There's been many times I went, oh my God, I can't even believe I'm making love to this babe. She could be a Playboy centerfold <laughs> any time. And so it would just be mind boggling. And and I just like, I, I, I just didn't want to miss out on loving people that I think deserve to be loved. <laughs> and well so put. when I... I realized I was married to my first wife for 17 years. And by the end of it, both of us were really struggling because we both really wanted to enjoy love with other people. But our kind of Christian vows just didn't do it for mm -hmm. us. Um, she's in another monogamous relationship, at least as far as I know, she's monogamous. But so when I met Penny, I, I just told her the truth and said, you know, I can't, I can't be, I don't ever want to have to lie to you. I don't ever mm -hmm. want to have to live a life in the shadows. It, it will, mm -hmm. it will eat me alive and I won't be able to do what I came to the world to do. And I don't want you to have to live other than you want to. And she said, I'm fine with that. I, I want you to be you and, and I know you'll give me room to be me. And so our agreement was, as long as we wake up in the morning willing to solve our problems together, then we stay married. But the day we don't want to do that anymore, we don't make a big deal out of it. We just celebrate we had a good journey together. And so I I think we've been together 27 years. No, we've been married 26 years. We've been together 27 now. And I would never want to be with anybody else. I, I, I know Penny is, Penny is the most amazing teacher I've ever had. The Institute <laughs> wouldn't be here without Penny. Yeah. She's ultimately the mother of the Czech Institute. When Penny met me, I said, oh, by the way, if you're looking for some rich, successful guy, I'm broke. <laughs> and she smiled. She goes, well, I'll, I'll help you with that. Yeah. And I went from flat broke. Penny had the Institute to $2.5 million a year in about two and a half years. Fuck. I mean, that's amazing. what happened. Mm. When, that's what happens when you, you have the right partner with mm. you. And she's always let me enjoy honest relationships with women. I've always been right up front with her. Um, and then, you know, she told me, look, you can have seven wives if you want, as long as they cook, clean, contribute to the bottom line, and do not talk too much. Because I don't like a lot of gossipy, yakety yak chatter. Mm -hmm. I'm, I got things to do, and I don't want to be distracted by <laughs> that. But, I, you know... Uh, when you start getting into a committed relationship with two wives, you realize every time you add another wife, you bring the complexity way up. And you and it brings the complexity up for everybody involved. So um, I just found that um, I don't need more. Um, and I've had sex and love with enough women to, you know, sort of, fulfill that and and mm. and can still um hug them and love them and and just i guess as i've grown older i don't need the physical connection mm. to um affirm the love i i actually mm. can um feel it that doesn't mean that the the man in me doesn't want to make love to all of them cuz i do yeah. you know that that's always there i mean i'm <laughs> i'm not dead <laughs> Uh, you know, and I'm a, you know, a pretty athletic, healthy male, you know. Yeah. And so, I mean, uh, like, I'm not going to deny that, that there's a, you know, a, a, a man dragon inside of me. But I also know what it takes to manage love and what it takes to manage relationships. And my rule has always been do no harm. If you, mm. If you have sex with somebody else and it's harmful to them or... 
you know, to my wife or wives, then you really have just, you've just, you've basically tainted the quality of the love. And, yeah. and I don't want that in my life because one of the things I've found is that to keep my connection to spirit tuned, I can't invite illusions into my life. If I have to maintain or create illusions to get by and let the little boy in me run wild, um, then my connection to source gets more veiled. And with the responsibility that I have guiding the kind of people that come to me for help and the tough decisions they have to make, I cannot afford wrapping myself in chaos. Mm. It's just too dangerous. Yeah. So I've learned through my experiences, I ha you always have to make a decision. What what woman do you love the most? God <laughs> or all the other ones running around in bodies? And if if my love of the ones and bodies gets in the way in the, of the one that keeps me safe through the death process, then I've mm. fallen in love with something that is... Um, very impermanent but i need the lover that will be with me through everything and and knows the way and that you know sophia is wisdom right mm -hmm. that's that's the divine feminine and um i feel that um my relationship with sophia is foremost so any thing that stops me from the purity and the connection to that leaves me very insecure because I know how tough life can get. I know how mm. scary life can get. I know how chaotic life can get. I've been broke. I've been successful. Um, I've been lost. I've been physically wounded very badly. Um, like, I, I know what life's like. Yeah. And I know that if there's one thing that you need to navigate life, it's a deep connection to your soul, which is God inside of you, which is why I say soul is what you and God create together. And if you want to fill it full of illusions and trickery and lies and uh, that kind of stuff, then you, you have to deal with what you create. Yeah. And God loves it all. So mm -hmm. if you want to dance with the devil, God says, here I am. <laughs> <laughs> Let's dance. <laughs> What's the uh, what's the number one thing um, for people listening to connect to their soul? I know it's a big thing, but well, it's not hard really. The, the easiest way to you know you are your soul. I mean, there's no separation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the this is why practicing meditation is so important because you got to learn to shut your you got to get out of your identification of yourself with your ego, which is largely your thoughts, right? Mm. Your ego is your thoughts. If you had no thoughts, you'd have no self. <laughs> it's only because yeah. you can think, I am. I'm Jake. That's how you know yeah. you're Jake, right? Yeah. If someone else jumps in your head and says, no, you're not Jake, then you'd be really confused. <laughs> and that's called an entity possession. Yeah. Um, So the, the secret really is just to empty yourself of your own chatter and then just say to your soul, dear soul, if, if you're there, please communicate to me. Talk to me. Communicate to me in a way that I know it's you and it's not my ego self talking. And mm. your soul will always show up for you <laughs> always mm. um and it's it's really not more complicated than <laughs> yeah. that. i mean there are some complications because as the you see the more you align with your soul the mm. more rapid your spiritual evolution and spiritual evolution is death to the ego mm. so the more you work with your soul the more the ego fears it's losing control so it begins to try to trick you out of it. it'll tell you oh you don't want to meditate today you're mm. too tired oh you don't have time you know, your ego will start throwing up excuses, which are easy to buy into, mm. but those are really the ego trying to subvert its own slow death. Yeah. Because ultimately, the end game is the merger with your soul, which is in alchemy called the hieros gamma, so the sacred marriage. It's where the male of you as a man and the female of you as soul merge together as one mm. or in a woman it's the feminine f body merging with the masculine soul because mm. the soul always takes the opposite 
sexual polarity because we're mm. ultimately God is whole, right? Mm. So for Jake to be whole, there has to be a feminine soul inside of him. For a woman to be whole, there has to be a masculine soul. Mm. That's what Jung called the soul of a male. He called the anima and the soul of a woman, mm. the animus. Mm. I got a ring that says that, that I picked up. Is that right? That's cool. Amazing. So anima means animation. Your soul is what animates you. Without your soul, you're just a corpse laying on the ground. Mm. Someone dies, the body doesn't do. It gets cold and doesn't move. So the soul is really the animating factor. It's mm. it's the consciousness that's living and breathing in you. Mm. And so um, the point is, is that your ego will start impersonating your soul. And that's the day you got to be careful. Mm. And when I get students coming to me saying things like, oh, my soul told me to eat a, I could eat a box of Oreo cookies every day and I'd be fine. I'm like, no, that's what your <laughs> ego is impersonating your soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, my soul told me I can do DMT as much as I want and, and it'll contribute to my spiritual evolution. I say, no, that's not your soul talking. <laughs> because if you do more DMT than you can integrate and take into the world as a productive contributor, then you are nothing but a drug addict, mm. no matter what. Mm. So I've watched this a thousand times, you know, and you, so you really got to stay in the practice of calming and centering yourself and knowing when it's your ego acting versus, mm. or your shadow, which is part of your ego, versus when your actual soul is talking. Mm. And if you don't master that practice to a fairly high degree, then when you actually are in trouble and you're scared and you need guidance from your soul, your fear will guide you because you can't tell the difference between your mm. soul and your ego, which is where fear, the soul is not afraid because the soul knows it can't die. Yeah. So the soul can face mm. the dragon. But the ego gets scared. That's one of the ways mm. you know. It's like if, yeah. if you're operating from fear, you're not hearing your soul because yeah. you have got to be able to park it and say, okay, I got to get real still. And I and the other thing is you have to be brave enough to hear the truth. Yeah. Most people are not brave enough to hear the truth. That's the big problem. Yeah. If you aren't ready for the truth, whether it's be about you or about someone else or about life then you're you're going to stay stuck and you know the soul will always deliver you the truth and the truth takes a lot of responsibility the truth can be scary fucking oath yeah. <laughs> amen to that yeah i mean a lot of people should have held still during covid yeah and look for the truth yeah instead they let fear guide them and a lot of them are gone now yeah or badly injured which is worse than being gone massively so um, those are some tips. I mean, really, it's a practice. There's a million things I teach people as they arise, but in a five-minute yeah, kind of expose. Yeah, sure. that's, that's what really, Spirit Gym's for. <laughs> yeah, that's what Spirit Gym's for. And, and that's a nutshell. And I mean, you know, you, you got to look in the mirror and see the truth of the diet choices and the lifestyle choices you're making instead of why me or, you know, yeah. what's happening to me or you know, making excuses. You have to, you have to know the truth about how you're using money because money is power. Um, I mean, the truth is all around. It's mm. always reverberating back at you. But people, they want to pretend to be religious. They want to pretend to be spiritual. Look at mm. all the so-called spiritual guru leader types mm. that ran off and ended up doing the opposite of what they stood for during mm. COVID. And, mm. and we got to see where the real spiritual yeah. leaders were. And I was dead shocked at some of these people. I was like, mm. well, that even surprised me. <laughs> yeah. People I never expected would flip over like that. Yeah. You know, and it's like, my point is though, you know, you really have to start with the easy stuff. You know, that's why I let my soul guide my painting and my rock stacking and what clothes I wear mm. and how much food I'm going to eat, what types of food I'm going to eat. Because then you really get in the habit of picking up what I call your soul's signature. You know, mm. just like you know your mother's voice mm. you, or your father's voice, you know when your soul is, is guiding you and you know when your fear is guiding you or your ego is guiding you. And if you don't develop those skills when it's safe, it's very dangerous to think your soul's guiding you when you're scared to death. Yeah. Because then you can't hear small voices that speak from silence. Mm. It's like, because what's going on is like a lightning strike. 
so um that's the commitment really mm. that's the commitment Life always, life has to be somewhat tough or we wouldn't grow. We yeah. would just sit around eating donuts and watching television yeah. shows and smoking pot. <laughs> and we would, you know, we would just become um, shadows of our potential, <laughs> you know, so. I said to God, I said, this year, I want a, I want a growthful year, but I don't want it to be too painful. I want, <laughs> I want it to be painful enough that I grow enough, but not too painful that yeah. it's going to be traumatic. Well, that's there's nothing wrong with that. The secret is just not making it painful yourself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's usually not God. It's <laughs> yeah, usually yeah. us. Yeah, I guess you you get what you ask for, right? And that's made up in my mind. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you, you know the thing is, is um, you you need to. Um, Remember, you're 50% of every relationship, and that means mm. persons, places, and things. So, um, you know, don't do stupid things with money. Don't make business deals that you didn't think through. Don't say yes to people when you mean when you mean no, mm. or when your heart says no. Mm. Um, you know, dot dot dot. Mm. Uh, that's usually how we make our life real complicated. Mm. Um, yeah. You know, don't run to doctors for help that you should be able to manage yourself because you're just not paying attention, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, when you look at what complicates most people's lives, it's their own lack of participation, commitment to, and love of themselves. God doesn't really need to make it too tough. Yeah. God just sits back and says, I'll do whatever. <laughs> Here you go. You get to be me. I'm going to go for the ride with you. Whatever you want to do, I'm all for it. You know, if you want to be sick, Tired, overweight, out of shape, get a disease. Yeah, I've done all that before, but I would much prefer to create something novel. Mm -hmm. So if you want to really add something to the world, not more of the same old, let's do that. But th that requires commitment. Mm -hmm. So that's it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Paul, mm -hmm. for your time. I know how busy you are, and um, it means the world to, to us at Creative Oh, I'm Culture grateful for you guys yeah. out there sharing the love and... Yeah. yeah, people need leadership by example. So when I see people really doing it, that's it's why I'm alive. You know, yeah. like I I get to see what you're doing and your partner and mm. you're, you know I've had many people tell me about how successful your podcast is and how it's helped revive the awareness of my teachings in Australia. And um, I mean, God, if I didn't have people like you out there, I would have wasted my whole life. <laughs> so really, I have to say thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, yeah. Yeah. Oh, much love. Thank you. Well, lots of blessings on the journey, and you know where to find me if you need me. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, we're going to come out next year, and IMS5, and Callan's oh, going to come. Yeah, and, good. So, fuck yeah. All Thank right. you. Uh-huh. <laughs>